All right, welcome back everybody. Hope you had a nice break. We're now gonna do our 11 o'clock session, which is Overcoming Barriers, Promising Practices from Experienced Programs. So let me start out by um, introducing our panel. We have four fabulous folk here today. Dan Deasy from College of DuPage. Wait, Dan. Elizabeth Hobson from Elgin Community College. Arlene Santos-George from College of Lake County and Laura Williams from Danville Area Community College. So I would need to start out first of all, thanking these four individuals because I'm not sure what the actual number is of times that the four of these people have said yes to requests from me personally, from SIPDC, from ICSPS for the Transitions Academy, but it's a very large number. So thank you for once again, agreeing to join us to talk about promising practices. And what's interesting is, um, and I wanna point out because not everybody was here whenever uh, the, the break, these four started asking each other questions about how things were going and about how things, how they're running um, things at their program. And I love because what they just modeled is that they are still trying to figure out ways to overcome barriers. That's, you know, we don't just overcome the barriers once. We're always learning, we're always progressing, especially in this time, these times. I wanna point out two other things that I've noticed over the years about these four individuals that they have in common. One is that they're all really good problem solvers. They're all good at saying, okay, here's an issue, here's a barrier, um, then what do I have in place? What are my resources? How am I gonna work around this or through this? So I salute them for that. The other thing is all four of them have been early adopters. Um, some of the individuals here have been working on ICAPs in some capacity or another for 10 years or almost 10 years, getting close. And um, they were willing to take off with the plane and build it while they were flying. So we appreciate them for that. I do wanna also mention that for the barriers that we're gonna talk about, for some of them, um, we may, it may, they may actually address them as what they're doing right now in pandemic times. But what I asked them to do was to tell me originally, how did you overcome this barrier? So I don't wanna put the pressure on them that they have to address um, that they can choose if they wanna talk about pre-pandemic or post-pandemic. I will let all of the participants know that we have other sessions coming up later on this afternoon and tomorrow that talk specifically about how are you doing um, now that we're in a, virtual, in a virtual world. So before we get started, cause you didn't sign into this session to listen to me, you signed in to listen to the four of them, but let me just set the stage. Um, if you were here this morning, whenever Kathy and Whitney and Jennifer welcomed us, Kathy talked a little bit about the NRS Evaluation Learning Community. This started a year ago, and um, we, did, we started with working with AIR, which is the American Institute of Research, and sent out a survey like last December. So I don't know if anybody even remembers that survey so much has happened since then. We, we looked at those survey results and then also data that we have um, at ICCB. And what we were able to validate is the professional development through the Transitions Academy has a positive impact. And hopefully everybody kind of knows that already. That's why you're here. And that's why these four keep saying yes, is because they know that um, they can help lift all the boats um, by raising the water level in Illinois. Um, what we've also validated is coordinated professional development between adult education and career and technical education has laid the foundation for service integration through the system and that programs that participate in the Transitions Academy are situated for better success through scalability and completion rates. And then also lastly, that um, Transitions Academy positions colleges to scale ICAPS programs. So what we're still completing, we're doing right now, is one of the other parts that we told AIR that we would do, being the state of Illinois would do, is that we would capture promising practices from programs that have scaled. And then we, in this, when it says ICAPS model one, that's we had to kind of define our, our parameters and that's what we said we would look at. Um, so what we, what we really felt would be valuable is to take lessons learned. And we've been doing that for some time in the Transitions Academy, but we're doing it specifically today for identified barriers. And these identified barriers came from the field in that survey that happened 11 months ago that said, these are the things that we need help working through. So that sets the stage for 
Um, we're going to go through, I think we have six or seven barriers, and I'm going to kind of pass the mic down the table. You know how when we're sitting in Effingham um, at that panel table, we're going to do that. And so I may not have time for every single person to answer every single question, uh, but hopefully we'll get a lot of good information. And then also one of the things that you're going to be asked as participants is to give us some feedback because what you want is gonna drive the future professional development. What do you want more information on? So if you say, I wanna hear more from Elizabeth about uh, recruitment and retention of ICAP students, then we will go back and ask Elizabeth one more time to share. But right now, let me turn it over to Elizabeth. Can you tell us a little bit about how at Elgin you have worked through and passed the um, identified barrier of recruitment or retention? Oh, sure. So as far as recruitment and rec uh, retention in ICAPS, uh, retention hasn't really been that big of an issue, to be honest. Uh, when we have had students leave the program, for the most part, um, they've had to leave because uh, of personal issues that they, it was just beyond, um, you know, what was going on was more than they could handle for a variety of personal reasons. So we've really found that the program in and of itself uh, is very strong for retention. Uh, as far as having our student support specialists available uh, to help with all kinds of barriers that students might be uh, encountering, uh, things as far as, uh, you know, childcare issues, uh, issues if they're having any with faculty members, uh, perhaps if they're having, uh, you know, issues juggling their uh, employment uh, or, you know, whatever the issues are between our student support specialists. And we have one of those for healthcare professions. And we also have one um, working specifically with the uh, manufacturing uh, students. Uh, and then uh, also, of course, the student, um, the, excuse me, the uh, faculty and the support classes. So when you're looking at, at those faculty members, um, again, the communication, the positive rapport, the ability to uh, meet the needs of the students is so high. So retention hasn't been too big of an issue. Recruitment, on the other hand, can be challenging. So uh, of course we do the typical things that everybody is probably doing, postcards, radio, social media, um, you know, things on our, um, the ECC website and all of the typical things. But some of the other things that we found that have been helpful have been asking the CTE faculty if you can go in and recruit in their classroom. So sometimes we find that students uh, who didn't come through the adult education pipeline might very well be sitting in there uh, in the CTE class already. So perhaps they're sitting in the welding class and um, they are skills deficient, perhaps they don't have their GED or their second language learners, uh, but for whatever reason, they didn't come to our door first. They went straight through the college process. So we have found that that is a good recruitment tool. Uh, another good recruitment tool is uh, making sure that everybody at the college knows about your program. So advising, registration, financial aid, all of these areas so that if students are in any of these other areas, uh, there's more than just the adult education division talking up the program. We've also found that to be good. Um, and I'd say those are kind of the main uh, things that I would mention at this point. All right, thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, very helpful. Um, Arlene, let's pass the, the microphone to you. Do you have anything to, sure. to share in addition? Well, yeah, so I'll start with recruitment because that's always the most exciting part for me because that's the most challenging part, like Elizabeth had said. So uh, basically the way that we recruit is we start with career awareness. And so we bombard the students with a lot of opportunities for them to learn about, you know, the CLC uh, programs, CTE programs. And so we have what we call the student success fairs. And so with the student success fairs, we actually partnered with all the academic divisions that have CTE programs. And then the fair is, um, you know, it's like the whole morning for morning classes and the whole evening for evening classes. And what they do is they do a dog and, show, a dog and pony show for their programs. And then the students actually 
you know, the students are prepped by their instructors in terms of like, here is, it's sort of like a conference for our students and then they actually circle what rooms they're going to go at certain times so that they can learn more about the industry, learn more about the program, learn more about the occupation, learn more about how much does it pay. And then we also have the Job Center of Lake County be part of that and financial aid and advising and all of these other um, uh, student development programs so that they know exactly what it means to transition to college or transition to ICAPS. So we have sign up sheets from, from that, um, from those student success fairs and also job fairs because job fairs, we basically tell our students, here's a manufacturing job fair. This is an exercise for all students who are having classes on Wednesday, uh, you know, just circle around and then just uh, identify what uh, occupations you found out from those, uh, from those uh, vendors or from those employers who were there. And so sign up sheets are really very important because the sign up sheets is the first thing that we go to when we have to, when we have to recruit for ICAPS and bridge programs as well. So, um, so that's one way. Uh, the other way is that uh, the students also fill out at the beginning of the semester, uh, what we call a goal form. I don't know if everybody has that. It's a separate goal form from what ICCB has in terms of like the intake form. The goal form is like, what is your career? Do you have any, do you have any career goals? Do you have any educational goals? And it's very specific. What type of uh, career are you talking about? And the, the instructors in our class, the instructors actually, sorry, I'm having a team call. Hold on. Um, so uh, the instructors actually go through the goal form and explain to the students. Uh, so it's part of their uh, career exploration lesson plan. And then we get those goal forms and then we enter them in PeopleSoft. So when the time comes for us to recruit for ICAPS, we know exactly who to target for computer information technology. We know exactly who to target for HVAC and things like that. So, um, so that's one way that we recruit. Uh, the other way is that we also do uh, class visits to the higher level classes. So like ASE uh, and also bridge classes and also advanced ESL classes. And we have what we call a student success team. We have four and a half staff members. Who, that's basically what they do is, you know, make sure that our students transition to college. And so they have what we call caseloads. Uh, caseloads is, uh, you know, like a, a group of 250 students in three classes assigned to them. And they really bombard them with like visits and with emails. And so part of that is recruitment for ICAPS. So they visit the class three times a semester, and then they uh, basically have flyers for all the ICAPS programs. So despite all that effort, we still cannot get, let's say, 20 students for an ICAPS program. We have them evenly distributed across different ICAPS programs, with, you know, five to eight students with a starting cohort, and that's good enough for us. So that's recruitment. Retention is basically, like I said, a student success team is, is actually um, uh, assigned to the ICAPS cohort. So it's the, the ICAPS cohort only sees one staff member throughout the whole duration of their program. One person to go to regardless of whether it is about financial aid, it's about uh, personal problems, um, um, academic problems. So we have a student success coordinator, coach, mentor for every student in ICAPS. And then we also have, um, we also have, uh, I'm sorry, my Teams is always popping up. Um, uh, we also have uh, selected very, very particularly the faculty who will be the support instructors or the team teachers because uh, if I hear of an instructor, a CTE instructor and an adult education instructor who are not doing well and who have no business, uh, they don't advocate for our students, they don't support our students, I let them go. I mean, I just basically tell them, 
you can't be assigned to this class in the future anymore for any ICAP support class or any ICAP CTE class. So you really have to be very selective about the faculty because your retention depends on how well they treat your students, adult education students, and how well they support them, how well they prepare them for any exam, any test, any exercise. So I would say have a good case management system and also have a good faculty um, that will be advocating for your students. Yeah, Arlene, I know early on in training, we talked a lot about having the right teachers and you just illustrated that. Um, could you, uh, before we move on, Arlene, could you repeat the software that you use to enter the students? Oh yeah, so everybody have a student information system. So ours is PeopleSoft. But PeopleSoft, what we, okay. Yeah, but what, right. we, what we did was we work with IT uh, and IT basically creates a page for us wherein we can actually enter certain fields. The field is um, uh, adult education goal right something okay. like that. so they just and that's where we enter it uh, it's in the student um i think it's in student information um so yeah okay. all right work, I think, to establish that page all right thank you thank you both to elizabeth and arlene i want to make sure we get to all the barriers so dan and laura do you have anything different that you want to add or should we move on to the next one I would like to throw in, you know, make sure that you're working with your WEOA partners because this helps with both recruitment and retention. And I think Arlene kind of referred to this, but making sure that, um, you know, because they have goals too. So all of the programs have, they have goals. So all of us, if we're on the same page, you know, they can do the recruitment for you because as they're talking to their clients, they're like, oh, well, you, you know, you're interested in nursing. So there's this a CNA program where you can get your, HSE and your CNA at the same time. So, and then they also are able to offer a lot of supportive services. So even though I may not be able to buy bus passes, they can buy bus passes or one place can play, pay for the, um, can put a child in the Head Start program or pay for childcare. So really, really, really use those WIOA partners and make sure that you're present when they're having those meetings because those, you know, they, they kind of do the work for you but then you, you also help them. So great partnership there. Okay, great. Three reallys on that. Dan, anything different? Yeah, the curse of going last, everything that came before me. Uh, we're definitely, uh, I, would, I would also um, echo the use, utilization of the WIOA partners. Um, while I think the bulk of our students come from um, our core programs in that transition, you know, following the core sequence and, and getting people to transition out of our core programming into uh, pre-bridge, bridge, and then um, actual IET, ICAPS programs. But um, we've we've uh, worked really closely with our WIOA partners. One of the new initiatives we have is that for all uh, Spanish-speaking students, um, that we handle the whole intake process for um, our one stop. So we get referrals from them. So those those folks are are interested in getting into job training right off the bat. Um, but we work with them to fill out the application, make the assessment, um, provide an assessment with CASAS, um, and uh, try to, if they're not um, proficient enough to, to fully engage with the existing programs that WIOA, our WIOA partners offer, um, we can assist them with the, our core programming and put them into uh, that ICAPS trajectory. So that helped uh, quite a bit. Um, also, we're, we're um, developing a feeder program for our earn and learn program at the college. So it incentivizes adult ed students to um, get on a track where they can, they can be part of an apprenticeship program post um, our, you know, our, our, our course sequence. So, um, and then everything that everyone else said. Okay, thank you. And so Dan, since we don't give you the same curse twice, do you want to start us off on um, the next uh, hold on, I think I went too far. Yeah, we did. Okay, so the next barrier is cost of tuition fees and materials uh, for CTE courses. You want to start us off there about what you've done? Sure, yeah, and I think this will probably be similar for, for most uh, programs, but we do, you know, you always hear the word braided funding, so we, we certainly apply that um, to, to support tuition fees and materials for CTE courses. So we use a combination of uh, Perkins funding 
Um, we work with our RIOA partners to get Title I funds, community block grants. Um, and we've also worked within our institution um, to develop specific scholarships from our foundation, uh, through our foundation, and also through institutional funds to have set-asides um, that would specifically cover costs um, when we can't cover them with our other funding streams. Um, and then, of course, adult education um, does provide a, a significant amount of support outside of that, uh, the direct CTE tuition. Um, so again, our approach is uh, very much using the braided funding model. We've also worked with our WIOA partners and if, if they, they had a specific need, they wanted to start a manufacturing uh, program and uh, we put it together for them. It was an ICAPS program um, for a very targeted uh, group of folks that they're working with. And they, you know, we were able to build it and they were able to, to cover do all the recruitment, cover all the costs. So again, I think working really closely with um, our WIOA partners um, is, is key to this, so. All right, Laura, do you have anything to add? Yeah, thanks, Dan. Thanks, that's what I was gonna say. Just teasing. So uh, again, You're welcome. Can't, can't even, you know, you have to use your WIOA partners. They, they, they've got the money, They've got the time, they've got the charge, use your partners. But I would like to add that, so at DACC, we have waived the tuition for most of the courses since the beginning of, of having the programs. Now, if there is a, um, if there is a program such as uh, one of the partner agencies that can pay the tuition for the student, then we let them pay the tuition. But if there's, a, if there's no other funding source, we, the college will waive the tuition for the program. Um, then we use, again, our, our support people, just like uh, Daniel was saying, our, our support teams, like uh, you know the nonprofits in the area, community action always seems to have a lot of money. And, and those of us that have been with adult education a long time, we know that Dan, Dan hit it right on the head, braided funding, braided funding, braided funding. And um, you have to do that because everything comes from a piece of this or a piece of that. So one person in the CNA program may be covered 100% by, by our Vermillion County Works We Owe a partner. Another person may have their tuition waived, but then I don't have money to pay for, um, say, their, their uh, TV test. So then maybe Community Action can pay for the TV test. I can't buy the uniform for when they go to clinicals but community action can pay for the uniform for clinicals. So it's just a matter of, you know, shuffling that deck and, and playing, finding who can, who can do what, and then um, just using the partner agencies. But again, the college has uh, always agreed to waive the tuition because I think they look at it as future enrollment for the college. Very good. Okay, thank you. Um, we're just working our way back. Arlene, do you have anything different than what's uh, already been said? Yeah, so um, I mean, yeah, just to reiterate too, Perkins is always the one that covers the materials for all the ICAPS programs. Uh, we make sure that we budget for that for Perkins. Tuition and fees, we really have to dissect the population that we have for ICAPS for those that are documented and those that are undocumented. So most of the ICAPS participants are undocumented. So obviously we need to raise like about $100,000 to cover their tuition. Yes, folks, it's very expensive. So about 85,000 to uh, 90,000 is the cost for tuition and fees for our, our cohorts in ICAPS. So where do we get that money? Uh, Dan actually uh, brought it up too. So we use state funding, state basic funds to uh, cover the tuition of CTE approved courses that you can have ICCB approve your request to fund those CTE tuition with state basic money. So we allocate like $50,000 to $60,000 to cover the cost of tuition for the first two courses in the sequence in the academic plan for each certificate program in ICAPS. And then the rest we actually fund with scholarships from the foundation. And uh, in terms of building that scholarship for foundations, I just have to say something that it is gonna be tight. I don't know for other institutions, but because of COVID-19, the scholarship monies have actually dwindled down. 
Uh, so that is one of our biggest challenge for the spring is where to get money for from from the foundation because um, our scholarship monies have have dwindled because of being given for COVID-19 purposes. But yeah, foundation is always the good source. So you you have to also be very proactive in seeking donors yourself as the dean or as the director or as the manager. You have to work with foundation to go out there in the community and which we did before. Uh, so I did get one and I was supposed to get another one, but COVID-19 hits. And so um, it is part of our role uh, to actually get uh, donors. All right, thank you. And Elizabeth, this time you get the curse of the last person. Do you have anything um, different that, to share? Um, I think most of the things that I would add have already been said. The only thing I would add is that uh, at ECC, we also do have a three credit hour tuition waiver for students once they complete um, their HSE and also for students when they complete the advanced level course for ESL. But really other than that, it's graded funding, just like they're talking about. We're getting money from a variety of sources in order to help students along the way. All right, thanks. And though, since you went last, Elizabeth, are you willing to, to take on this barrier, how to blend ESL, ABE, ASE students into one cohort? Sure, yeah. sure, okay. sure. So um, the support courses tend to be pretty small. Uh, I know Arlene had already mentioned that as well. Uh, we've had some as small as two. And then because of the size of the lab courses, I think 16 is the largest we've ever had. Um, <clears throat> again, because you need to be, um, you, you know, you can't go over the size of whatever the lab can hold. So I believe that's the, the largest we've ever had. And um, so they do tend to be small. So the faculty do have an opportunity to focus uh, on individual student needs if necessary. But uh, all of our <clears throat> cohorts at ECC are blended. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry about that. I'm getting a frog in my throat there. So all of our cohorts are blended. They all have um, a variety of students, uh, whether they're ESL or uh, ABE, uh, ASE. Now they would, they're, okay, I won't go there, but so they're all blended. Uh, I would say a big challenge that we have is having full-time CSE or CTE programming and then having the HSE completion. So that's an issue that I would throw out there that we've always had. It's challenging um, for them to be able to do both because they're in a full-time CTE program. And then when you're supporting that program, uh, in order to throw in the other things that one needs to complete the HSE. So that is kind of a, a problem we're having, but because that is an issue in kind of a backward way, it allows you to more easily add in the ESL students because we haven't really been able to totally focus on what's needed for the HSE completion piece. We're more focusing on what's needed for the CTE programming. So I think that's kind of a backwards way of, I'm not sure that I'm explaining it very clearly. It's a problem, yet at the same time, it helps to alleviate this barrier of having ESL students in the same classroom as students who are HSE. So um, one of the things as well is kind of a focus on their similar needs. Uh, many of the students who are in these programs we find um, have a need for enhanced lessons in math and in vocabulary. And so you would, you know, that's one way to go about it is really be focusing on these similar needs that they, um, all the groups have. So techniques like EBRI and direct and explicit instruction are very, very effective. And um, those really tend to be the largest needs that our students have. Uh, that we're seeing anyway, and that's needs and instruction that can be um, delivered to uh, all the groups of our adult ed students. So, uh, and much the way that others have said is it's that support 
uh, instructor who really makes or breaks it. And so making sure that that instructor is very well qualified and understanding, you know, EBRI and direct and explicit instruction and, you know, obviously many other forms of instruction uh, as well. But um, I think that those are some of the more important things that we've learned. All right, thanks. And I just want to mention again to everybody who's listening, because I think any one of these topics could be a full one hour webinar. So if you're hearing things and you'd like to have more information, take some notes um, and make sure that you put that on the evaluation and we can, you know, revisit these topics. But Arlene, do you have anything um, different to share? Yeah, so in uh, selecting ICAP students, we are very, well, we are very selective. We do have a process, uh, a selection process for admitting a student into an ICAP certificate program. Uh, we, like I said, we basically target higher level ESL and ASE and um, uh, to a certain extent, maybe high intermediate ABE students. But uh, when they, uh, enter into an ICAP certificate program. Uh, the ESL students are, I would say, more or less really uh, prepared. And so, um, I mean, but I couldn't really generalize that that is true for every ESL student. There were cases where in a student actually have problems, you know, really fitting in, but then that means we have to give them, a, aside from the aside from the support instructor or the team teacher, you know, giving this individual student more time, we also have to provide a tutor for the student. So, but that's why we're very selective. And that's why, like Elizabeth said, I mean, the cohorts are small, five to six, and maybe we're lucky if there's eight students or 10 students. So, um, so that's, one, that's one way you have to be very selective. And then number two is, of course, the instructor um, themselves have to be really um, trained in handling both ABE, ASE, and ESL students. And we have an instructional support manager that provides them with a lot of resources on how to do that. Plus, of course, we have the ICAPS team teaching training itself, which we're going, which, which we're planning to augment. It's just a one-time course, but I think what we're going to do in the future using Perkins money is actually to add on to those training uh, specifically to address, you know, whatever challenges the instructors have in teaching ICAPS. All right, thank you. In the interest of time, it's okay, I'm going to move on to the next barrier. Um, small programs or small numbers. You all have kind of been talking about that a little bit already. Um, but Laura, do you want to uh, start us off talking about small programs, small numbers? So our programs are always small, but we one of one of our most popular programs is the CNA path. And with that, the state mandates that you have a small number of students. So it's an eight to one ratio, one student, um, I'm sorry, that'd be a really smart student, one student, eight teachers. So it's eight students and one teacher. So it's typically a smaller number anyways, um, just by the nature of, of uh, the state mandates. So we use that and, and that's always enough to support the program for um, instances such as welding or some of the other programs that aren't limited to the small number, even though we have a small number, we blend with other students. So I think some people have already covered that, but um, for instance, and, and actually the CTE side of the house, they are now starting to look to me to try to help some of their, their uh, sections run because they may only have three students up to a certain date that's wanting to enroll in their program, or I'm sorry, into that certain class. So they're not able to offer the class with just three students. Uh, we normally require six, seven, eight students here at the college in general. There are a few exceptions, but in general, we have to have that certain number of students to even run the class. So then they're talking to me about, hey, would you want to maybe come up with an ICAPS model with us so we can um, try to blend students? So that helps them be able to offer the sections when they want to offer them. It helps fill their classroom and it helps put my small number of students into a path other than the one I'm able to fill all the time, which is my nursing. All right, thank you. And Dan, do you wanna, it's okay, pass the microphone to you and tell us a little bit about College of DuPage. 
Sure. Um, you know, we, we found it uh, pretty challenging to offer all of our ICAPS programming, you know, at, as far as the starting points uh, within one semester. We learned that pretty quickly that there weren't enough students to uh, go around, essentially, um, to build cohorts for each one. So we do rolling starts um, and we do something similar. I believe Arlene had mentioned it about, you know, we do an assessment or career survey or inventory at intake. And based on the level, um, of the student level of proficiency in ELA or if they're in the HSE program, um, we kind of can gauge, we do a lot of recruitment when they're in our core courses. Um, and then we kind of gauge what type of cohort we have uh, based on the, the finish of those courses where, where we think they're gonna end up and we can um, gauge what kind of cohort we may have to begin to, to set a start date for a particular program. Um, our cohorts are small, just like everyone had mentioned. I think our largest we had 14, um, but that was that was very unusual. So we're typically around seven or eight students um, in each cohort. Um, so again, it's just kind of learning to predict based on the data that you have and the interest that you have and, and kind of cultivating those students um, to gauge uh, work with your CTE partner or if you're uh, developing a model too. Um, whatever partner you're using to, uh, to gauge a start date and be flexible. All right, great. And um, Arlene, you're shaking your head in agreement. So why don't um, I pass the microphone to you? What, what do you have to share? Yeah, no, I, I, I totally would second uh, Dan's, um, you know, uh, advice and comments here. Um, the, the key, uh, you know, we, we all realize that they're all going to be small cohorts, you know, seven to eight, five to seven, five to eight, maybe perhaps if you're lucky, 10. Um, but the, the key to actually making sure that you are able to sustain ICAPS or even scale it up is diversification. So you have to offer as many CTE program offerings in ICAPS that you'll have five here, seven there, five here, four here. And that's how you grow ICAPS because you cannot just grow by offering one program with 20 students and then another with 25 students. That's not gonna happen. So you really have to diversify. So for us, we are offering 13 credit CTE program offerings and two non-credit CTE offerings and we're building more. Uh, with the realization that that's the only way you can grow your ICAPS numbers. Uh, and then I'll echo what Laura said, you have to combine those uh, ICAPS sections with the regular sections so that you can have um, a, a class um, and that um, actually there are retention externalities or retention benefits to the other class, to the regular class, because they actually end up going to the support class. <laughs> Right, so um, so just keep on plugging. I mean, like Elizabeth said, I mean, there were instances when we only have like two students uh, interested and what we do with those, especially if it is a program that requires uh, language proficiency and basic algebra readiness, you know, you kind of put them on the side first and say, here, we're gonna help you with your developmental courses first. And then next spring or next fall, then we'll put you in the cohort. So there's like a holding place for them. All right, thanks. And Laura, did you have something that you wanted to add before we go on? I did, I thought about this real quick and just uh, you know, doing things that put things in place. So like buying the books for the class and then keeping the books, buying the reusable supplies like the stethoscope and the blood pressure cup, things like that, you know, but having all that, but keeping it in your program helps sustain it when you have those low numbers. So if you're buying the book and you're using that book over, um, that's a way that you start reducing the cost of the program. So then if you do have a smaller number of students, it's not so detrimental. So just looking at things that you can buy and keep and use for the next types of groups also helps with those small numbers. Okay, thank you. Thanks for that. Um, and we did have a question. Is the ICAP support class that you talked about, Arlene, mixed of different certificates? Do you have? So the ICAPs, because, so like I said, if you have five students in a cohort in a, an ICAP certificate program, the support class, and we call them IET course courses, um, they actually are very singular. They only have one uh, faculty member uh, from the adult education who teaches that class. 
Um, but, you know, we can talk about workload. Uh, you know, you can email me how you structure your workload because how can they be in the ICAP CTE class, the content class, and how can they be in the IET class and what does workload have to do with that? You can talk to me offline about how we do it. Oh, there's Elizabeth. <laughs> So um, I also want to just mention if all of our panelists wouldn't mind putting their email addresses when you're not talking in the chat, then if there people do have follow up questions, if you're willing. Um, it, uh, let me move on to Elizabeth. And do you have anything to add, Elizabeth, that hasn't already been shared about the small program and small numbers? Well, the one thing that I wanted to say is kind of to, because um, for the most part, it's the things that they've already said. We have anywhere from two to 16 we've run programs and again um, just piggybacking on what's already been said you maybe just get a couple of seats in another you know and, and other students may not be in ICAPS per se and you're just holding up a quarter of the class for example um, I know those have already been mentioned but just piggybacking on the question that was asked of Arlene you want to make sure that you have a support class for each ICAPS pathway. Because if you're blending them, you're really doing more of a bridge where you're looking at, you know, a sector, which is kind of more what a bridge does, is looking more at a sector. Um, because in IPAT, or excuse me, in in the um, in the ICAP support classes, everything you're doing is based on what's happening in the CTE coursework. And so if you're trying to support, you know, 12 or 15 hours, depending on how, how big the actual pathway is, you don't really have the ability to be supporting another pathway that's six or 10 or 12 hours. You, you don't have time and it's, it, it, take, it also takes away from the whole cohort model. If you ultimately are saying that you're gonna try to put two or three cohorts into one class. You don't have a cohort anymore. You've got three mini cohorts, which is very different. So um, I think that's a really important piece to add that um, even if your cohort is very small, you want to make sure that those students have a dedicated support class to their pathway. All right, thank you. And um, I know that we've had a couple of comments made about ESL students and how they can be enrolled in ICAPS and how they can be prepared. Does anybody have something in addition that they would like to share about this that they feel like they haven't said yet? This is the point where the microphone's floating and somebody can grab it if they want it. And if not, we'll move on. Only so the only suggestion I would say is like, uh, of course, the biggest uh, barrier for ESL students is the language uh, barrier. So like I said in the in, in previously, uh, for students who cannot meet the language proficiency of let's say, for example, like computer information technology, they have language proficiency um, requirements. Uh, what we do is we actually have allotted, um, I, in my own budget, in adult education budget that is provided by the college, this is college funds, we, it's, we, we, we have a tuition waiver for ESL students who want to go to ICAPS and the ICAPS program has language requirements, then we, we, we put them into developmental classes like in English language instruction or, or uh, English um, one-to-one. Uh, or 108 and 109, and we pay for that. And so we tell them you have to wait till the next cohort starts, but at least they already are taking the developmental classes to get language proficiency. All right. Dan, did you wanna share something? The only thing that uh, may be a bit unique for our, our program is we're, we're using the Washington State model idea, which is the integrated digital English acceleration program. I'm hoping I get that right, but it's an intensive program which we're using as kind of a pre-bridge um, to prepare students to make that transition. So um, and set them up from pretty high beginning level um, uh, to get the mindset of transitioning and gaining the skills to get into a um, ICAPS program, a bridge, and then an ICAPS. So. 
Uh, the other thing too, I would like to add, uh, and then then we're gonna be doing IDEA too, because I hired a new faculty member who knows about IDEA. But anyway, the other thing is, um, the other thing that we are planning to do, which we were not able to do because of COVID-19, was we're gonna we were gonna be having summer boost. Summer boost was just for ESL students and even for ABE ASE students who have not gotten their high school equivalency, but really need a lot of reading and writing. So summer boost was what we were planning for, and hopefully when COVID-19 is over, we can implement it. All right, so um, there was a question posted. Let me just throw this up. Um, and I think the, the pro well, one of the questions was the program that Dan talked about, and I think that's a project ideal. Is there an L in the end or is there an no, I? No, there's no, it's idea. Oh, idea. Um, okay. And you, if you want to do a quick search, you can look, look at like just Google idea, Washington State adult-based education. They have a really nice web page that explains kind okay. of the concept. And um, it's, it's been a really good program for us. Um, not only, you know, I'm not going to sell it too much, but uh, I think the students and the faculty got, had a great experience. Um, we used it also to meet all of the requirements, we hope all of the requirements, if you have the IELC, the civics money, the federal money, um, the idea model meets those requirements, right, like right out of the box. Um, and for the experience that we've had, we've had, we've had been using it until COVID hit, uh, we've been using it for over a year, uh, modeling it for over a year. And the students that were enrolled in that program compared to those enrolled in um, traditional ELA or ESL courses were performing on state and federal, you know, um, the functioning level outcomes at a much higher rate. So um, if you want more information about our experience, you can certainly contact me. Okay, we do have all of the um, panelists have shared their email addresses now. So thank you very much for being willing to do that and to um, yeah, help others out. One follow up question or comment. Um, the biggest barrier that this person finds is, is not just the language for ESL, but status. How do you get students to feel and encourage to enroll into ICAPS if they feel they can't obtain a job afterwards? Does anybody have any quick thoughts about that? Go ahead, Arlene. I'm sorry, they can get a job. <laughs> I'm, um, I mean, they can get a job. Believe me, there's uh, for the undocumented students, they have underground economies that they know where to get the job. I mean, even our CNA uh, graduates, they get jobs. <laughs> I was like, what is going on? They actually have their own internal or, you know, cultural or connections. And so, uh, Automotive technology, you know, there are automotive technology, com not companies owned by Hispanics and they hire Hispanics. Uh, so I'm just gonna say uh, for those that are documented, uh, we have the Job Center of Lake County help them and the employers that we actually are very active in our CTE program. So we help them find jobs, but for undocumented, there are ways. So just- All right, okay. Thank you, Arlene. And another question is, somebody wanted to know, have any of you used Ability to Benefit? Have you, I mean, anybody want to speak to that? Elizabeth's shaking her head. Okay, all right, thank you. Then we're going to go on. We have two more barriers and just a little bit of time. So let's break that up. And the first one is length of time of program and intensity. Um, Elizabeth, is that something you're willing to start us off with? Sure. Um, so I wasn't sure if this was for the support class or for the regular class. So I'll just kind of address both quickly. Um, most of our support classes are 3.5 hours and they started off more at three hours. But what we found is that that wasn't long enough for students to be able to post test. So most of them have grown to three and a half hours. And the only exception to that, I believe, is our phlebotomy, because if it went to three and a half hours, the support class would actually be longer than the phlebotomy course. <laughs> so we didn't want that, but it is an issue because that means that the majority of students in that cohort don't post test, which is an issue. So um, we tag them up also with CNA in that one. And so if they do both, then they can post test. But if they only do phlebotomy, they rarely post test. 
Um, as far as the CTE courses, again, they range from um, the shortest one is phlebotomy, which including their clinical, although our support instructor doesn't go to the clinical, so we don't include that in the support course, but that's 4.5 hours. And then I believe our longest um, is 25 credit hours. And that is, I think our IST. So it depends if they're one semester or two. Uh, the 25 credit hours is obviously a two semester. It's 12 credit hours, one semester and 13 hours the other. And then in addition to that, the students have the support class. So they have a very, very full schedule depending on their cohort or excuse me, on their CTE pathway. Some of them are shorter, but some of them are pretty hefty. And again, that's a, that would be a two semester, but even at 12 or 13 credit hours, and then your three and a half hour credit uh, support class, that's a very hefty load. All right, thank you. Um, Arlene, do you wanna share anything about length of time, program intensity? Um, well, usually what uh, ICAPS is supposed to be is just a one year program. So uh, we usually have, you know, like it can be a program that can be accomplished in one semester or in one year or at the very latest by summer. Um, so um, that's why we're also limited by, you know, the number of programs available at CLC uh, that only have 15 to 17 credit hours. Uh, for the class itself, uh, of course, we are bound by what the CTE content class uh, schedule is, but for the support class, it's normally one hour per week um, and uh, for each course, for each class. That's it. All right. Um, Dan or Laura, Dan, would you like to go next? Do you have something? Yeah, I would agree. I mean, for us, it's more built around the academic schedule, the CTE academic um, schedule and the kind of the trajectory of courses they have um, in place. I would say for model two programs though, you have much more flexibility. Um, so we try to build in, while we have a structure and a start and end date in mind and the total number of hours that, that we're going to cover, um, we do try to make the students aware that there may be some flexibility to this based on pacing and outcomes throughout the program and our partner um, in each of these is aware of that too. And a lot of that is driven by the partner and how they feel that the, the students, you know, the, how well they're doing um, throughout the program if they have to slow the pacing down more than we in initially anticipated. Um, so I find there's a lot more flexibility with the model too. Um, so I just wanted to throw that in. All right, thanks. And Laura, do you have something to, to share? Yep, just real quick. I think that, you know, the, the, I found in my experience, the shorter I make the programs, the more successful I am because a lot of times our students have life circumstances that pop up and, and they don't, um, they can't deal with all of those uh, triggers at one time. So the easiest thing to let go of is education. And when you're choosing between your family or going to school, you need to do what you have to do for that moment. So um, the quicker we can get people through a program, the more success we have for the retention of that student. So when you're building programs, I've had um, you know anywhere from the eight weeks to the two semester, and I'm much more successful with retention and outcomes when I have the shorter programs. Although that's not always possible to do depending on what you're trying, which skill or which path they're trying to go into, but the shorter the program, the more success you're going to have for outcomes. All right. Thank you. Um, it's nice to hear a variety of different uh, answers. And a wise person once told me, never mess with people's lunch at a conference. So based on that advice that was given to me, which I agree with, let's. here's our last identified barrier. So maybe if each of our panelists can take one minute and just hold to one minute, and then um, we'll be able to get everybody off to lunch. So um, Elizabeth, how about if we start with you again? Okay, so trying to be as quick as possible, I would say that, you know, this role to get that support generally falls to our student support specialists and the support faculty. 
And as we've said over and over, getting the right people into those positions is key because they are the key to ICAPS. They are the ones, they are the support. They're the ones who keep those students informed, whether it's issues happening in the classroom in the case of the support course faculty or issues happening outside of the classroom in the case of the student support specialists. Making sure you've got the right people in those positions makes all the difference. Thanks, Elizabeth. And just as a reminder, Elizabeth's from Elgin. Dan from uh, College of DuPage, what do you have to share with us? I would 100% echo that. Um, I think in addition to, to that, um, having as many of the folks that are participating, and, and this can't always happen, I understand, but have them um, use your feeder. So you know, if you have a pre-bridge or a bridge, it will certainly go a long way in preparing folks to handle some of the academic challenges um, we also use some of the college resources um, and also community-based agencies to, do, to provide very specific targeted tutoring and mentorship. Great. And Laura, what do you have to share? Anything different? Definitely. Um, so a lot of us have the Secretary of State Literacy Grants at our colleges or in our area. You can ask them for help with tutors to help the students with specific areas and then um, making sure that your support based teacher is integrating study skills because you know again people that haven't been successful in high school and have dropped out of school they've not gained a lot of those study skills and if you don't know them you don't know them so incorporating that into your support based class is key all right, and Arlene, can you take us home? What 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 can well, you? Uh, we <laughs> we start in the beginning uh, when a cohort is starting or cohorts are starting in the semester. We have them go through what we call an ICAPS orientation for an orientation for new ICAPS students, and so that actually provides them with a lot of information about the college resources, where to go. But essentially, like I said, the go-to person is always the case manager, which is the student success coordinator based in adult education. That's the person who really negotiates, refers, ad advocates for our students. If our students need tutoring at the writing center or at the math center, if our students need help with their financial aid application, um, it's really, we have, like Elizabeth said, you have to have the right person in that role because otherwise ICAPS will fail. Uh, students go through a lot of personal and academic issues. You need somebody to motivate, motivate, motivate. So um, that's all. All right. So I, I, that kind of brings us to lunch, but I do want to wrap this up with one final thought. And all of our panelists, Thank them very much have alluded to this and that is that there needs to be a champion there needs to be someone who moves this forward who is not going to take no for an answer and that's what all four of these individuals have done at their program they've had a lot of uh, partners that have moved with them but they also have they've been the champion for the ICAPS program and for Bridges and for um, all the other feeder programs that there are. So again, I thank Dan Deasy, Elizabeth Hobson, Arlene Santos George, and Laura Williams very much for all the good work that you're doing, for being willing to share, and for giving us your um, email addresses. Uh, tomorrow, Bevan will talk about formal programs, but you know, always look for the people that can help you. That takes us to, and if we have additional questions, and we'll try and follow up later, but we're getting a whole lot of good jobs from, from those out there, so thank you very much. We are going to go into lunch, which lunch, you can um, eat your own conference chicken, if you wish. Um, we have four topic areas, and if you look at your agenda, if you would like to pull up a chair around a table, bring your own lunch, and have a conversation, um, you can take a look at your agenda and look at those topic areas and join a lunch conversation if you wish. The formal part of the Transitions Academy will convene again at one o'clock. So uh, we'll see you hopefully at lunch and or at one o'clock at the next sessions. But thank you to everybody. And this, we are going to go ahead and shut this link down and uh, we, you can join us again with another link from the agenda. So thank you very much again to all of our presenters.